We're now going to look at hybridized orbitals. Before we do, we will revisit the concept of orthogonality, as we will use it as well as normalization in this next section. In a quantum mechanical sense, if two states, say psi m and psi n, are different, then they are orthogonal. As a mathematical operation, if you were to take the integral over all space of the complex conjugate of one wave function times the other state's wave function, we would get zero. What this represents is that the two states do not overlap and are completely separate, independent states. We could demonstrate orthogonality using the two different states of the particle and infinite square potential problem, and we also examine orthogonality when we looked at spin states. Let's now look at the first type of hybridized orbitals we will examine, the sp orbital. To develop an understanding of the sp hybridized orbital, let's look at the molecule BEH2. Experimentally, we know that the two beryllium hydride bonds are equivalent and that they are 180 degrees from each other. The exercise we will do now is predict this 180 degree geometry between the two hybridized orbitals. To do this, we will take a linear combination of the 2s and 2p orbital to form an sp hybridized orbital. These are expressed by xc1 and xc2. This means that one electron in the beryllium 2s orbital is promoted to the 2p orbital to facilitate this hybridized orbital. We will align these hybridized orbitals along the z-axis, so we will be mixing the 2pz orbital with the 2s. The coefficients a1, a2, b1, and b2 will tell us the proportion of each atomic orbital that will be mixed in to make these, this hybridized orbital. Once these four constants are known, we can write the two bonding molecular orbitals as psi1 and psi2, being a linear combination of the 1s orbital on hydrogen A or hydrogen B with the sp hybridized orbital 1 and hybridized orbital 2 respectively. Let's now determine those four constants a1, b1, and a2, b2 where we have a1 is a part of c1 where we have a1 times the 2s orbital on the beryllium atom plus b1 of the 2pz of the beryllium atom, and c2, where we have a2, 2s, plus b2, 2pz. And so the assumption here is that we have our um, hybridized orbital oriented along the z-axis, which is why we're going to be using the 2pz orbital in this case. But that was just a choice just to simplify the problem so that we didn't have to mix in the other 2p orbitals. But basically what that means is that we have the 1sp hybridized orbital that's going to be pointing and look something like that. And then we have the second one, which we know already that it's going to be 180 degrees from it, but we're going to demonstrate that to be the fact, or that to be true here. So there's the down one, and here's the up one that I'm just coloring in right now. And so like I said, we're going to show by solving for these four constants, this a1, b1, a2, and b2, we're going to solve and show that these two orbitals are oriented 180 degrees from each other. One assumption that we're going to make right off the bat is that we're going to assume that a1 is equal to a2, and we're going to assume that b1 is equal to b2. At least what we're going to say is that the magnitudes of these values are going to be all the same. And the reason why we're going to make this assumption is that there's no reason for us to believe that, that these two um, hybridized orbitals, the C1 and C2, if I write them out explicitly, there's no reason for them to have any different mixing between these two coefficients. Like there's a different mixing of 2s and 2p into these two orbitals. So we're going to make this assumption that basically the, the a constants are the same and the magnitude of the b constants are going to be the same. So that's our, our first assumption that we're going to make in this case. Our second assumption that we're going to make is that c1 and c2 are orthogonal. And this is essentially the admission that we have two hybridized orbitals and that they represent two distinct states, and so this is how we can then stick electrons like a pair of electrons into each state because of course when the hydrogen comes in we're going to have one hydrogen on this side and one hydrogen on this side and so the bonds that each of these form is going to be a bond that's going to have 
a pair of electrons in them, or shared between them. And so these have to be two distinctly different states so that these electrons can then be in these states being spin up and spin down. So we have to require that these two hybridized orbitals are orthogonal so that they do represent two distinct independent states. So let's apply this orthogonality condition to our two states as a first step to solving for these four constants. So what that means is that we're going to be running an integral over 0 to infinity, 0 and pi, 0 and 2 pi of C1 star, so the complex conjugate, sorry, times C2 times R squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. And then since they're orthogonal, then we're going to say that's equal to 0. So let's explicitly sub in for our two hybridized orbitals. Here's our integral over all space. Subbing in for C1, well there's no complex parts to these values, but I'll write them as complex values anyways. So A1, um, 2S star, plus B1, 2PZ star, and then it's going to be multiplied by A2, 2S, plus B2, 2PZ, and that's multiplied by, again, the volume element, sine theta, dr, d theta, d phi. That's still equal to 0. I'm now going to FOIL all these terms. I still have my integral between 0 and infinity, 0 and pi, 0 and 2 pi. Well, my first, well, I'm going to get a1, a2, 2s star, 2s, and to that I'm going to add um, the outside, a1, 2s star, b2, 2pz, and I'm just going to just reverse the order of these two constants, because I'll put the constant out front, b2, 2p, 2s, sorry, star, um, inside, b1, a2, 2pz star, uh, 2s, um, plus outside, b1, or sorry, last, b1, b2, 2pz star, 2pz. And I still have r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi, and all that's equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start canceling out terms. And the reason why I can start doing that is that what I'm going to do, or what we would do next, is that we would take all of these, like this volume element, and we'd foil that into each of these pieces and that we would apply our integral over all space. And so what we can do is we can invoke normalize or not normalization, but we can invoke uh, the fact that these functions are normalized and the fact that some of these are orthogonal to know the answers for some of these. So for instance, since we know that the 2s state and the 2pz state are orthogonal to each other, then the integral of these two um, states, like the, the 2s star times 2pz, the integral of that over all space, is going to end up being zero because it is in fact orthogonal. The same thing is true for this case where I've got the 2pz and the 2s state. I've just got them reversed now where I've got the complex conjugate of the 2pz and the 2s integrated over all space where we know that those two states are also orthogonal. So that integral also becomes zero. We can also assume that these orbitals are normalized. So when we look at the 2s star by 2s in this first term, since we know that they are normalized, the integral over all space for them is going to equal to 1. And the same thing over here, the 2pz star times 2pz, these orbitals are normalized, so the integral over all space in that case ends up being equal to 1. So the upshot to all of this is what we end up being left with is a1, a2 plus b1, b2 is equal to 0. So let's analyze what this result means. Now remember a1 and a2, these are numbers that are associated with the 2s orbitals, and the 2s orbital is spherically symmetric. So there's no directionality that's going to come out of a1 and a2. So we will assume that a1 and a2 are going to be positive numbers. So that means a1 times a2 is going to be positive. The directionality of this is going to be totally set by the 2pz orbital. And then that's essentially going to be then dictated by this b1 or b2 coefficient. Now we've already defined 
by our diagram here, we've already shown that C1, which I've got shown right here, and I've got it highlighted in green, that's by definition, in, as we've drawn in the picture, to go in the positive z-axis. And so what we're trying to determine is basically what is the direction of E2 or C2 relative to C1. But that means that B1 is also has to be a positive number since it points in the positive z-direction. That means that for this to be satisfied, um, B2 has to be a negative number. And that's so that we basically have some number that's positive, which is the A1 times A2. The B1 and B2 has to be a negative number. And that negative number basically comes from the fact that B2 is going to be a negative number. And so now we've actually shown that this 180 degree relationship, because if B1 is a positive number, and if B2 is a negative number, that just means that we've got something pointing in the up z direction, and we've got something pointing down in the z direction. And so hence, there's a 180 degree difference between the directions of these two orbitals. Another vital piece of information that we can get from this result is that we can generalize now this, since we know that the magnitude of A1 and the magnitude of A2 are the same, then we can just say, well, there's a value A squared, and we know the magnitude of B1 and the magnitude of B2 are the same, and we know that since B2 is going to be negative, we can say minus B2 or B squared, well, that's still equal to zero. But what this means then is that our value for A, whatever it is, is going to be equal to the value of B. And so that means that then there is an equal mixing in these two coefficients coming across here, A1 and B1, and A2 and B2 are going to have the exact same magnitude. So the, these four numbers end up being exactly the same.